Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. This is video number five, entitled, Why, uh, parentheses, NT, parentheses, uh, right is wrong. Okay? Uh, I am reviewing the views of Dr. N.T. Wright, one of the most noted modern scholars, and his views of the redemption of creation. Now, I cited for you last week from his book, Paul, how it is Dr. Wright's view, and by the way, he expresses these views uh, in his book, uh, three-volume set, The Faithfulness of God, etc., etc. He expresses this view uh, in many of his works. Dr. Wright's view is that we're not waiting for the destruction of planet Earth, the destruction of material cosmos. What we're waiting on is for Christ to come at the end of time, at the end of the current Christian age, to recreate, to restore physical creation to its Edenic perfection. Because, you see, Dr. Wright believes that physical creation, all of it, bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes, lies under the curse of Adam. In other words, the Adamic curse did not come on just Adam and mankind. The Adamic curse came on the totality of creation. Now, of necessity, of logical necessity, that demands that bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes, the totality of the created order, trees, grass, shrubs, trees, again, and even rocks, are under the curse of Adam. Now, quite honestly, I'm not sure I'm not sure, I'm just not exactly sure that cursing, what, how, or how do you describe the cursing of rocks? Were rocks once soft? Now they're hard? I, I, quite frankly, I'm confused about this. But again, if you're going to talk about all creation and make no, make no mistake, the argument is that all creation, including the dust, including the dirt, including the very ground itself, which ostensibly ought to include rocks, are under the curse of Adam. So again, my question is, I'm not, I, look, I'm not being facetious here. If you're going to say that all creation lies under the curse of Adam and is subject to futility, what futility do rocks have? What futility were rocks placed under? Now, we're going to be talking a good deal in upcoming videos about the word futility from the Greek word matiotes. And you're going to find something pretty amazing about this word. But nonetheless, the question I'm posing at the very outset today is, what is the nature of the futility to which rocks dirt, trees, bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes was subjected. If you're going to make the argument that that is true, then you must be able to demonstrate that from the text. By the way, there's a very fascinating new book out, and I've only just begun reading it. It is entitled, God's Good Earth by John Garvey. Mr. Garvey's premise is that, well, yes, indeed, the common view of, quote, historical Christianity is that the natural creation is under a curse and that the, the curse of physical creation, bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes, must one day be lifted. And that curse transformed in back into the Edenic 
perfection of material perfection. Now again, as we proceed, I'm going to be looking closer at that, and I'll be sharing with you some of the thoughts from Mr. Garvey's book. What I have read so far, uh, again, admittedly, is just superficial, you know, uh, almost glancing over it. I'm very, very eager to read this book. I have to tell you that. Because once again, his premise is natural material creation was not, is not under a curse from Yahweh. Matter of fact, he makes the argument it wasn't until the 16th century that that doctrine arose. Fascinating stuff. I'll share it with you. So what I want to do today is I want to focus on an aspect of Dr. Wright's presuppositions, an aspect of his doctrine that is virtually ignored by him, except except that he gives us kind of a cursory uh, Passover almost. Uh, He sort of kind of mentions it, then he passes on over. Here's what I mean. In Romans chapter 8, 18 and following, which by the way is the fundamental text that Dr. Wright uses to prove that material, physical creation lies under a curse. So Paul says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. Now, I want you to consider, first of all, that creation would be revealed to be sons of God. Well, that raises an interesting question right up right off the bat, does it not? If bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes are to be redeemed by physical recreation, restoration, does that not mean that at the end of time, we're going to be calling bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes brother or sister mosquito, brother or sister slugs, Cockroaches will be our friends. Cockroaches will be our brothers and sisters in Christ as children of God. Yeah, well, okay, but yeah, that's not working. Certainly, it's not working on an emotive level, is it? But you see, if you're, if you're going to argue that creation here, and again, we're going to have more to say about creation, but if you're going to argue that Creation is that which is to be restored, and that is material and non-material creation as well. In other words, it's more than humans. Then you then you have to take the position that every animal, every bug, every slug, every mosquito is going to be revealed as a child of God, as a son of God. Now look, in various discussions with futurists who believe in the yet future redemption of creation, I have asked them, are you going to tell me that bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes will one day be redeemed and be revealed as sons of God? They've said yes. So I have asked them, are you telling me that Jesus died and that his blood will be applied to bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. Well, i got to tell you, I've had a whole lot of futurists sort of kind of backpedal at this time and say, well, you know, I don't have to answer that question or whatever. Well, yes, you do. But again, more on that later. Here's what I want to focus on right at this juncture in this in the rest of this video. Whatever the redemption of creation was, whatever the deliverance from futility was that Paul envisioned, here is one indisputable fact. 
He expected it very soon. Let's make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen. Paul's eschatological expectation was of an uh, an imminent event. I'm going to skip over several passages in the book of Romans to focus on, very quickly, on Romans chapter 13, 11 and following. Paul said, and now do this, knowing the time. Now, the Greek word time, or the time word translated time there, is from the Greek word kairos, which means the appointed time. Paul was telling the Romans, to whom he wrote chapter 8, you know what time it is. And people like to say, well, you know, concerning the day and the hour knows no man. But they forget that Jesus said the Holy Spirit was going to come and reveal to the apostles things to come. So here is Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, telling them, you know what time it is. And now, knowing what time it is, that now, noon, Greek word noon, that's Paul's now. Now, it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now, notice Paul's emphasis on now. This is important. Why is it is important? Well, because N.T. Wright, in his writings, loves to emphasize Paul's now time as the critical, fundamental, eschatological time in which the new creation had broken into the old creation. You catch the power of that? So for N.T. Wright, Paul's now time was the messianic era. It was the new creation. Well, guess what, folks? The new creation is the time of the redemption of creation. So if Paul was saying, as he undeniably was, he uses noon, now, twice in one verse, Now it is time to wake out of sleep. By the way, that is taken directly from, it is an echo, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting condemnation. Paul is drawing on Daniel. Many scholars have noted that. I didn't make that up. Okay, I got to hurry here. But now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Well, okay. Is this salvation that Paul is talking about a different salvation from the redemption of creation, the manifestation of the sons of God? If it is, where's the proof of that? Is this salvation different from Romans 11, 25 to 27? And so Israel, all Israel shall be saved. When would all Israel be saved? At the coming of the Lord out of Zion in judgment. What salvation is this? Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. My goodness gracious, this is powerful, powerful language. And by the way, it's a direct reflection, an echo of Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, and the parable of the five wise, five foolish virgins. You know, when the night was far spent, the night was way on up, It was way on up in the night. When the cry went out, the bridegroom comes. That's Romans 13. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Literally, has drawn near. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Folks, do you see what Paul is saying here? Paul is expressing an imminent eschaton, an imminent arrival of the day, which, by the way, John said, 1 John chapter 2, 5 and following, the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. Folks, that's Romans 13. Over and over, the New Testament writers inform us that the night was passing away, the light was about to dawn. What is that day? Well, it's the day of the Lord. It's the true light of Jesus Christ in His epiphany, in His manifestation, 
in his revealing. And Paul said, the night's far spent. The day has drawn near. And he uses kind of a distinctive Greek word there, but I won't go into that. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And now the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Well, the time of the redemption of creation is the end of the millennium when Satan would be crushed. Paul said, Romans 16, 20, the time for the crushing of Satan was coming very soon. And thus when we come to Romans chapter 8, and we find Paul saying, I am convinced that the suffering of this present time, that's Paul's now time, remember, is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, I want to look at three words very, very quickly. Paul said, I am convinced that the sufferings of the now time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is literally about to be revealed. He uses an infinitive form of the Greek word mellow. Now, the lexicons tell us that the primary meaning of mellow means about to be. The Blas de Bruner, Greek-English grammar, under article number 356, tells us Mellow with the infinitive indicates eminence. Do you catch the power of that? And look, I started to just run off, you know, a sheet this long and this long and this long this morning of scholarly citations by some of the world's greatest Greek scholars commenting on given texts in which Mellow in the same identical construction as Romans chapter 8 in which they tell us and they make the comment that the respective uh, author, New Testament author, that they're citing was indicating the imminence of that event. And by the way, many of them are commenting on Romans chapter 8. Uh, Andrew Perriman, for instance, let me see, I, I think I had that quote um, think I had that quote. Maybe not. Uh, I didn't run that one off. Like I said, I started to run off a ton of them, and I just decided, well, you know, uh, I won't do that at this time. If you want me to do that, let me know. So we have here a word that, that the Greek lexicons say it can mean certainty to occur as well as imminence to occur. Well, you know, if it's imminent, it's pretty certain to occur. One might speculate and say, well, if somebody says it is about to be, or if it is to be mellow, it may or may not be imminent. But I want to share something with you. I do not find this in the lexicons. I, I want, want that right up front, all right? I'm not inventing something, I hope. Unlike some others, former preterists, who tell us that mellow is only used of eminence if it was going to happen within days or weeks at the most. Well, number one, you're not going to find that definition in the lexicons, ladies and gentlemen. And I have challenged those individuals who have made that claim to produce a single lexical quote, and they, when I make the challenge, they literally disappear. I mean, they can't find that definition and that delimitation in any lexicon. And like I suggested, I can produce quote after quote after quote after quote from world-class Greek scholars, of whom these individuals are not numbered, citing the fact that in one eschatological text after another, including Romans chapter 8, that Mello indicated that which was about to be, eminently so. So that's problem number one for Mr. Wright. Now, I said I want to make a comment that I, granted, cannot find a, an explicit statement about this in the lexicons. So 
on this level, on this level, I may be as guilty as the former predator. So I want you don't want to be absolutely objective, but I don't believe that I am misusing this, and I believe I have far more evidence for what I'm about to share with you than they do. And here's what I'm saying. Not only does Paul say the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed of us, in us, but he says the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits. Now, the word that is translated as earnest expectation is translated from a Greek word, apokaradokio. Now, pardon me, here's what Balls and Schneider, Greek-English lexicon, says. The majority of early fathers understand apokaradokio as an intensification of kara dokia, and thus an especially strong expression of expectation. It remains most probable that with apokaradokia, Paul intends to give expression to the element of earnest and eager longing. The preposition apo, therefore, or thereby strengthens the intensive character of the expression. It remains most probable that with apokaradokia, Paul intends to give expression of earnest and eager longing. Apokaradokia is, trans is defined as standing on the tiptoe of expectation. Now, let's be real here, okay? If I'm standing on the tiptoe of expectation, then I expect to see what I'm standing on my tiptoes to see. I'm not looking for something that is a gazillion years away because I don't think I can stand on my tiptoes that long. And again, I'm not being facetious. And what's absolutely interesting and fascinating and significant, N.T. Wright has produced his own translation of the New Testament. It's called the Kingdom New Testament. And his translation of Romans chapter 8, 18 and following, says this. This is how it will work out. What, what will what work out? Well, if we're children, previous verse, we are also heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with the Messiah, as long as we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. Suffering, glorification. Please go back and watch the video on the sufferings of Christ and to see how it was the first century church that was filling up the measure of the sufferings of Christ. But I've got to hurry. This is how it will work out, N.T. Wright says. The sufferings we go through in the present time, now it's interesting to me that he makes almost makes this a timeless thing, but it's not a timeless thing, but it is the sufferings of the present time. Paul's present time. The sufferings we go through in the present time are not worth putting on the scale along the, alongside the glory that is going to be revealed. Notice how he glosses over mellow. He makes it simply a, a simple future. Instead of expressing the eminence that Balls and Snyder and other lexicons say is involved with mellow. But watch this. Yes, creation itself is on the tiptoe with expectation, eagerly waiting the moment when God's children will be revealed. So what does N.T. Wright do here? He admits tacitly that that for which Paul and his first century audience was waiting was something that they were on the tiptoe of expectation. And remember what I shared with you a moment ago. Paul is very clear. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 
The salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The salvation of, quote, all Israel, which would take place when the fullness of the Gentiles had come in, Romans 11, 25, and 26, and the destruction of Satan, which would be at the end of the millennium, was about to take place swiftly, quickly, shortly, from the Greek term, intakai, which is never, ever, ever used of rapidity with the exclusion of imminently. And so by admitting for us and with us that Apokara Dakia indicated eager on the tiptoe of expectation, N.T. Wright has put himself literally in a box. And here's what's ironic about this. Throughout his writings, as I've already indicated, and by the way, I'm leaving out one word because I'm going to discuss it next week when I, I'm going to present, you know, a summary of Melo, Apokaradakia, and then Apek Dekomai, and then there's another word that is a, a companion word that is used throughout the New Testament, prostikao, to be used for an expectant looking. But the point I'm making here is this. Throughout his writings, Throughout his writings, N.T. Wright tells us the new creation had already broken in to the old creation. Throughout his writings, N.T. Wright emphasizes the now time. And what he means by that is a contrast between the old covenant prophets who always said the days are coming or in the last days. And their temporal perspective was something that was far off. But, N.T. Wright informs us, Jesus was telling his first century audience that time foretold by the Old Testament prophets, that time had arrived. Matter of fact, in discussing the parable of the prodigal son in Romans, excuse me, Luke chapter 15, N.T. Wright says, this parable is about the resurrection from the dead of Israel. The son who was dead is now alive. The resurrection of Israel was taking place. Well, it's pretty obvious the resurrection of Israel that he's talking about was not the physical resurrection of decomposed bodies coming out of the grave. But N.T. Wright's point is the now time foretold by the prophets who spoke of the resurrection of Israel, who spoke of the restoration of Israel, that time had arrived in the first century. So the great question is, where do we find in Romans chapter 8, with its incredible insistence on the now time, with its incredible insistence on about to be, on the tiptoe of expectation, the eager looking for an expectation, upon what basis can we remove Romans 8 from that admitted eminence of the new creation found throughout the entirety of N.T. Wright's own writings? On the one hand, he tells us the now time had arrived. It was the time of fulfillment on the other hand, he tells us, oh, wait, 2,000 years later, even though Paul spoke of the now time, and even though he talk, talked about on the, on the tiptoe of expectation at the pre, his present time and the eager expectant looking for of his present time, we're still looking for the salvation that was ready to be revealed. We're still looking for the day which had already arrived or was dawning, we're still looking for the destruction of Satan, which Paul said was, was going to happen very soon. So, N.T. Wright on, the other, on one hand tells us, and he emphasizes the eminence of the eschatological events. And then he turns right around and contradicts 
his own emphasis on eminence, and he glosses right over the eminence that permeates, that saturates, and exudes from Romans chapter 8. I suggest that Mr. Wright, as much as I respect and admire him, I, re I, I respectfully submit Mr. Wright has destroyed his own doctrine of the redemption of creation. And yes, indeed, we have a whole lot more on this next week. Thanks for joining me. Go to my website, please. Get a copy of my book, Like Father, Like Son, in which I discuss Romans chapter 8 and some of these words that I've shared with you this morning. It will be an eye-opening experience, and you will see how the commentators, by and large, literally do the Passover on the eminence of Romans chapter 8. Thanks again. Have a great weekend. God bless. I'll see you on Monday.